Hey, family. What's going on, sir? How you doing? Hey, what's going on, Jonathan? How's how you living? I'm living well, man. Uh, trying to get situated. I see you got your water in hand. Oh, absolutely, man. I, I'm, it's hot in here. I'm getting thirsty. <laughs> Perfect. I got my water in hand, too. I see my family in here. Hey, hey, Drika. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Mitch. Dorian. Yeah, so I think we give it another couple minutes, let people join. Um, in the interim. Well, you got me all dressed up from head to ankle. And I ain't going nowhere but to my couch. Yo, bro, we might as well wear our Easter suits while we can. <laughs> it's not, you know, Easter, you know, the, the real way. Might as well dress up, right? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I got on, I got on Nike flip flops. <laughs> <laughs> I love. It, bro. Everybody, we at home uh, following the Let rules. Let get started around four or five. What's up? I said, people ask me, uh, where, Look, where man, we at? following the rules is key right now. Absolutely. And you weigh all in. It's like China's 76 weeks, bro. I was, gonna, I was telling my subscribers that you weigh out in Oakland. So uh, you got a whole nother. Um, the cases are pretty high out there, correct? Bro, we're, we're in like the, the 6,000 range, I think. I'm not 100% sure. But the cases being high isn't really an indication of the death toll. Um, but I feel like that's more a discussion for another day. To be perfectly honest with you, man, I, I think I want to stay as far away from talking about the, the negative implications of COVID as possible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, you said to bring some bright energy to bring some bright energy in the world. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. That's the way we got to do it. But yeah, give it another couple minutes or so. We'll let people join. Join. I was gonna say first. I want to say thank you for joining this live with me, though. This is my first time really doing IG live with my business, and um, I'm honored to have you um, to moderate this as well. I really love your style, your blog, your hustle. And your professionalism as well, man. So it's great to connect with great people. Bro, needless to say, the pleasure is all mine. Um, we go back. <laughs> like Boys and Girls Club. Back. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's nothing. When when we had that initial conversation, I, I knew it was a go for me. Um, also, you know, we did we did that feature, what, like two, three years ago? I, I think the last time I seen you was at Trilogy Lounge, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was like one of those fashion events and stuff. Lord Jesus. Um, I apologize for whatever foolishness I was doing. <laughs> 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 Leave it to me. Um, so, yeah, I guess I guess this is a good time to get started. First and foremost, thank you all for, for joining um, the Instagram Live. It's it's none other than my pleasure. Hey, Seth, can you uh can you back up just a little bit so we can see your face right now? I'm only seeing the bottom of your head. There you Bro. go. Yeah. Am I am uh -huh. I in view? Am I in camera view? Yeah, I can. I can see you. All right, perfect. Um, so yeah, like thank you all for taking the time to join this conversation. To be perfectly honest with you, uh, it's gonna be much less of an interview and more like me and him just having a casual combo. I think this is very much needed in the fashion industry. I don't know that there are major gaps because I feel like we're pushing towards a space where uh, fashion is being more inclusive of all shapes, sizes, body types, colors, complexions, so forth and so on. But uh, I think there's always space for a burgeoning designer. There's always space for someone who wants to innovate and, and sort of take their craft and push to the next level by incorporating their art style and like culture into what they do. And so it made nothing less than sense when we had this conversation initially for us to sort of present this same content to you all as the public. Um, with that being said, you know, Cedric Brown, bro, tell me, tell me about yourself. Tell me where you're from. Tell me why you do this. Let's hear it. All right. So I'm Cedric Brown from Cedric Brown Collections. 
Um, I'm 28. I'm born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, and that's currently where I reside. Um, I've been. I had my clothing brand now for five years. Um, I graduated from Savannah College of Art and Design. I studied fashion design there. I did numerous internships working um, at Sears, Kmart, um, Lee and Fong Limited, Carter's Oshkosh. And I've been on the ground with my business. So I specialize in men's and women's accessories. And what my slogan is, as you can see, I got some of my art on the wall. <laughs> you can hang it on the wall or you can... Um, or you can wear it to the mall. So you can see like this from the prints and stuff up close <laughs> with the pocket squares or whatever. And so my designs has been featured on um, CNN, Jezebel, Sheen Magazine. I had a few celebrities wearing my pieces such as um, actress Lynn Whitfield, actress Vivica Fox, rapper Young Thug, uh, rapper Wale, gospel singer, uh, Tamala Man. And the list is, um, can go on a little bit. And I love what I do. I'm very passionate about fashion. Man, I, I think I think that goes without saying, especially considering that you devoted your entire uh, post high school education to it. And uh, what's even more interesting, like I was taking a look at your website, and it seems like your your uh, professors in art school were very much pushing you towards like getting involved with a major corporation. And it seems like that's not the route you took. Can you talk a little bit more about like why you decided to deviate from that path? Oh, bro, you hit it right on the nail. So I don't, I mean, of course, I think naturally professors in college, they, they're, they're just like your, you know, parent or anybody who may invest in their kids and they may not necessarily be an entrepreneur, but they want, and they know that you invested in this education that we want you to have a, some security. We want you to have a job. We want you to be able to take care of yourself. And me, as as a lot of other millennials, we don't necessarily always want that for themselves. Um, me, since fifth grade, I always wanted my own clothing line. It's always in the back of my head. Like, I want to be like Ralph Lauren. I want my own clothing line. So when I had these various internships, it almost seemed unrealistic. Like, people, if I was to tell somebody <laughs> that I want my own line, that's what I want to do. People... You know, of course, looked at me crazy, like, okay, yeah. you're able to do that. Like, you don't have money for it. You don't have the funds. You don't, um, you got to have this, this, and that. And I think, like, a lot of people just aren't educated about entrepreneurship all the time. And since they don't really know a lot of the area, they, like, encourage you to go a route that they think is more secure. Um, No, I 100% agree with that. And I think – this is actually a, a really good uh, tangential point to, to focus on the weekender for a second. Um, the reason why I started pushing the development of this blog, which is really focused on millennial fashion, travel, and lifestyle, is because I feel like millennials as a whole get a bad rap for not following the normal structure for success. So like uh, previous generations were very much go, get a, go to school, get a degree, work a nine to five, do that for 30 years, retire, maybe start a second career, but ultimately have the White House with the picket fence and two and a half kids and so forth and so on. Like, that's not our story. Our story as millennials is, you know, we might go to school, but every job while we in school, and then when we graduate, we're gonna have a day job, a night job, a side hustle, and we're gonna get up and go to the gym at four o'clock in the morning. Like, <laughs> that's just how we move. And so that being a very atypical, for real, bro, like that being a super atypical structure for what previous generations have seen sort of gives them pause. They're like, oh, you're doing it wrong. But the reality is it's not wrong. It's just my way. And as I chart my path, you'll start to see the success manifest over time. So like we all talk, we all kind of are familiar with this theory of putting in 10,000 hours, but like we're trying to expedite that timeline. It's not going to take me 10 years to put in 10,000 hours. It's going to take me three. Why? Because I'm going to grind my ass off and we're going to get it done. So shifting gears a little bit, um, one of the things that sort of causes me a little bit of a headache is trying to uh, generate income from my blog because the way generally people who are influencers or bloggers or what have you generate income is like through sponsorships, partnerships, and like affiliate marketing, right? 
um, for you, you have a hard product, right? Like you're selling scarves and kimonos and so forth and so on. So can you talk to me a little bit about like what's your runway for sort of achieving like sustainability for your brand look like? And like how long it might've taken you to sort of get comfortable with saying like, hey, I'm Cedric Brown, I'm a designer. This is what I do day to day. I'm not doing anything else. I'm devoted to my business. Ooh, all right. So you said first, <laughs> Sustaining the business, correct? Like, how did I get it? Basically, the first part of the question was basically, like, how did I get, like, my customers and be able to take care of myself off my business? Is that what you were asking, correct? That's that's the whole question. Yes, sir. Okay, well, i say it, it takes time. So when I first started my business, of course, I was working various jobs, freelance work, internships, and... um. I was a little bit shy. I, I tell this story a lot when I do folks speaking. And I wasn't necessarily always confident, like, getting out in front of people, selling my product and stuff. But the funny thing is, though, my family, like, my family it has a hustle to them or whatever, like, just <laughs> gen the generations. So it's always been in my blood. Whatever, so, But I was somewhat a little bit shy. So one day I, I tell people the story. I was in the car. And telling my mom, like, I'm trying to sell these cars. People don't really want to buy my product. Like, I don't know what to yeah. do. And I, like, and I was like, I don't really want to go out in front of them. I don't want to go, like, go try to sell my stuff. To scarf for you legit. It made me really think, like, okay, I am doing something that's legit. And, you know, I don't. I'm not doing anything that will put me in prison. I'm doing something yeah. that I'm passionate about. I'm doing something that I love doing. Why not be confident about selling my product? And um, I say the more that you do that, the more you get out in front of people selling your product, the more comfortable you'll get at it. And then after that, it'd be like nothing like selling your product. For me now, it's almost like I enjoy doing that sometimes more than creating the art. <laughs> So it's, yeah, no, um, I yeah, so I think um, like the sustaining like your database of customers and all that, that, that stuff grows over time. Like I did various pop up shops. Uh, I worked with a lot of boutiques where I sold my stuff in their stores and did pop up shops there. Do art festivals. Got to do a lot of conferences, um, sorority conferences, and working with other corporations or whatever. So. As time progresses and times go on, I like my fan base keep increasing because I keep putting myself out there. And sure. so I say, sure. yes, I say that's the way to sustain. And like, you want to make sure that you stay in touch. Um, a lot of times people give me feedback that they liked how I was so personal with them. Like, you know, you want to have great customer service. You want to treat people well. Um, you want them to come back and shop with you. You want them to, you know, consider you as a friend and want them to believe in you, you yeah. know, like be all into it or whatever. So. No, I a hundred percent agree. And I mean, like it's, it's difficult sometimes to manage or to, to balance that rather with the, the ABCs of marketing, which are what always be closing. Right. Um, I think we're out of this era where people are finding sold to like, I want and how what you're giving me is going to actually benefit me. I don't want to talk about being Those are the critical components that sort of. Connection was also, I didn't hear the last um, question oh, that you were just saying. About that. What I was saying is, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, cool. So I think one of the critical components to sort of uh, creating a sustainable business is sort of balancing the personal touches with the ABCs of marketing, which are always be closing, right? So, yeah. you know, trying to understand what it looks like to personalize your approach to your audience and really just taking two minutes to have a, a clear and concise conversation with them about what their needs are is key. Um, I say that because like 
for me, just understanding what my value add was, was key. Um, and by value add, I mean like, who's your target audience? What do they care about? How does what you're doing matter to that audience in particular? Those are things that like, I feel like people who don't have a lot of context for business or generally don't have any hustle might not understand, but are like critical to your success. You agree? Um, yes, I do in somewhat. Like, to me, the target audience, though, for what I sell is very, like, I don't know, because, like, I took various business classes, and, of course, they tell you, like, you have your target market, your direct customer, in which I have that target audience where, like, I mean, majority of my customers would be somebody that's, like, early 30s to... I would say would be a fashionable customer, like somebody that loves fashion, they love luxury, and it's not, it's not necessarily a certain age group. You get what I'm saying? Like, because I feel like big yeah, brands yeah, for sure. Gucci and Gucci, like, I mean, or Ralph Lauren, like we were in elementary school wearing Ralph Lauren, but you also have a 70 year old, 80 year old wearing Ralph Lauren too, you know? So, and you I, also got I, young Joe wearing Ralph Lauren too. <laughs> 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 yes, so you have the people, you have the classic of the classic people, you know, a, a variety of people. See, that's the reason why I like, so once I, I always said that I wanted to like make my brand to be somewhat like Ralph Lauren for the fact that his customer range is so like broad. It's not just yeah, like, sure. a certain, it's not a certain demographic. And then it lasted for so many generations, like, I mean, yeah. 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010. And like, even though in certain communities, it, the, the hype may have went down certain times, but overall the business stayed there. So that's like a brand that I really look up to. I mean, but you gotta like, I know this is tangential, but like, you gotta understand who Ralph is. Like he was an innovator from the gate and anybody who brings like color to fashion. And when I say color, I mean like people who look like you and me, to fashion in a way that hasn't been done historically, bro, I'm tipping my hat to you every time. The likes of Naomi Campbell and Tyson Beckford being introduced to like fashion industry and print ads and stuff like that as a result of uh, Ralph Lauren's work, like phenomenal. Of course it's gonna be timeless. And like the way that he thinks about his, uh, his collections is all very central to like the American image like he takes a step back and is like okay how do i incorporate this country into what i'm doing and it's like not to not to rant and rave and boast about america as a whole because i think there are a lot of like inconsistencies with how we sort of publicize ourselves on a global stage versus what we actually do at home but like him having the foresight to be able to say i'm going to tailor my approach and continually do so in a way that's innovative modern and stands the test of time huge uh, yeah, absolutely. Like, I, I, I really admire him. For sure. Um, but with that being said, like, it sounds like, you know, you have this machine that's kind of rolling on its own a little bit. But the reality is, like, I know, at least for me, there is no way in the hell I'm doing this by myself. <laughs> like, just keeping it above with you. I have a team of people around me because I know my strengths and weaknesses, bro. I'm the, I'm the person that gets put in the streets. And like, I'm a, I have the gift of gab and the ability to connect with people. So I'm gonna continually leverage that. But when it comes to putting words to a page, I have a, a team of reviewers. When it comes to getting these photographs done, like I work with generally one singular photographer for the course of the three years that I've been doing this. Like, bro, there's a team of people that support me making this come to life. I'm wondering if that's true for you and if not, or if so, can you talk a little bit about why? Well, Hmm. <laughs> I, I mean, overall, I mean, my business is very, like, the people who work there are very small. So it's me, of course. I have my mom that helps me out with doing sales. I occasionally hire, like, one of my close friends, Takari. He's a brand ambassador, like, to do shows with me. Um, but I, I do outsource, like, my photography, like, for my photos, product shots on my website. 
Miss Teresa Hewitt, she helped me out with that. And um, I also, like some of my production or whatever, but majority of everything though is one man show. Like I'm the one creating the art, <laughs> the one like doing the advertisements and marketing. I'm the one like, even still when I'm doing pop-up shots, I'm designing the way I want everything to look. Um, even sometimes when I'm doing photo shoots, I still have to be the one to creative direct that part, even though sometimes I don't yeah. even enjoy it. <laughs> um, I, am, I make my website as well. Like, I'm the one having okay. to put the content in there, my newsletters. I'm the one looking for my shows, booking my shows. So, I mean, occasionally, though, I have my mom that will step in and help me do certain stuff. But overall, I do do everything. But right now, I mean, I I definitely want to grow and I want to hire more staff and have a bigger team. But for the first few years of my business, I was just, you know, you're taking a risk. I went full time yeah. with my business. So I'm like, okay, I'm full time with my business. I have the time to put in the effort to do all that work myself. Sure. And I can't necessarily, I got to survive. I have to, like, my profits for my business got to pay my rent. <laughs> nah, so I'm now, crazy. Yeah, so now that I've kind of, I have seen my business being profitable and that it can sustain, I do want to make more further investments where I can have more help because it's just going to make the business even bigger. It's going to make, like, the advertisement better, you know, everything. Like, I, I do think I need more of a team. So it's, it can be rough. All right, so look, y'all heard that, right? He said he needs more of a team. So if y'all do marketing or advertising, or y'all know about these design and fashion shows, y'all know about any of that. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I gotta repeat it. I said, I said the, the world just heard you say it. <laughs> you need you need support. So if y'all know about marketing or advertising, y'all know about these fashion shows, y'all know about these design clinics, any of that. Hey Cedric. <laughs> Absolutely. He's, he's open and available. Exactly. Facebook That's ads. At Cedric Brown Facebook. Collection. <laughs> and and gra a graphic designer would be helpful too every now and then. She like doing lookbooks, um, line sheets, or just advertisement. Like you got to put graphics on everything. And sometimes you just get so worn out. Like, yeah, oh, no, I feel 100%. like. I 100% agree. I think one of the critical components to like long term success is, <laughs> hey, he said he said uh, you got his number. So I don't know <laughs> what's going on here, <laughs> but hit your guy. <laughs> he gonna take care of you. Oh, um, that's, that's But I think one of, <laughs> one of the critical components to sustainability is like building a model that allows everyone to sort of. Um, execute to their strengths and sort of plays away from their weaknesses, right? And so uh, just a tidbit or a word of thought as you move forward, like build a team, understand what roles they're gonna play, allow them the flexibility to learn new things, but at the same time, like create a space where they're leveraging their skill sets and their strengths most often. Um, Fact. Fact. For sure. It's because like, I look at like other entrepreneurs who I know you know, um, that may have clothing lines and they tell me, like, I do everything, but it's other people who do it, really, like, everything, like, now, like, I'm like, you know, my thing is, like, from taking business courses is, like, outsource things that you're not good at and, like, oh, you sure. know, focus on yeah, not your weaknesses or whatever, you know, if it's something you're not strong at, like, don't be putting all your time and effort into doing that, like, give that to somebody else who really, really good at it, who's passionate about it, that's what's going to make the product even better. But focus your what makes, you know, what you're passionate about and what, you know, that you're strong is at. Because that's what people are going to flock to anyway. For sure. Um, and I guess last little bit from my perspective before we move on, but, like, I think one of the most difficult portions for me has been uh, just making sure that my, my vision for where to go next has been clear so that I can help other people to galvanize around it. Cause like big picture, if you don't have a clear vision and you're the one in charge, 
everyone's going to kind of do their own thing and it's never going to come together the way that you want it to. So like take a step back, take some time, do some introspective work, understand where you want to go personally, and then you can sort of help shape and mold the brand and head, head that direction. Um, so shifting gears to the next question, and sorry, I keep looking at my phone. I, I have them written down so I can continue with my I cues. But uh, <laughs> one of the things that sort of comes up in continuous conversation is as an entrepreneur, sort of how do you enter into your own endeavors? And then I guess as a secondary component to that, what keeps you inspired and keeps you going? I guess to clarify, can you hear me now? Uh, so the question is like, what is the best route to enter an entrepreneurial endeavor? And what keeps you inspired and keeps you on target in those efforts? Oh, okay. So like, with entrepreneur endeavors, um, I want to say when I first started my business, I took some small business classes. They have them everywhere. Like you can take free classes like SCORE, Goodwill. I, in particular, I took some small free business classes at um, Operation Hope. And then they kind of like went over writing a business plan. So anybody that's an entre entrepreneur or teach entrepreneurship, they always tell you to have a business plan. Now, I will say this from writing a business plan and actually going forward in your business. The thing is that you may write in your business may not be realistic because you that. <laughs> Unless, plan, right? unless you know that industry, you're absolutely right. What you say? I said, if you don't know that industry and you're just trying to enter, 100% right. Like, you go write this <laughs> business plan, then it ain't going to mean nothing in, in 10 seconds. <laughs> Bro, the thing is, though, like, I studied fashion design in, in school. Like, we more so, we studied, like, creativity, creating the best art, but we don't really study about the business. So, I'm just... Yeah writing stuff down, what I hear and what I think other designers do, like, I want my stuff sold in these stores, I want to move shop to these buyers, I want, um, I want to be featured here, I want this and that or whatever. And, like, I will say, like, as soon as you get in business, even after one year, you're going to realize that a lot of stuff that you, you wrote was not really, like, realistic or how you can tweak it to make it even better and you can grow your business to be even stronger. So, I will say, though, first, write a business plan. That's always a step with um, entrepreneurship. Also, I will say, like, if you can, get some mentors. I have, like, some great mentors yeah. that that are that really support me, like, when I'm in a down moment or whatever, like, I can reach out to them through email, text, phone call, or we may have lunch. We don't, may not necessarily talk that often. It may be once a month or every two weeks, three weeks or whatever, but we have this relationship built. And you don't necessarily have to get a mentor that's in the same field as you. Um, like yeah. I have some mentors, they're, they're amazing entrepreneurs, like, you know, but they're, they're, my, they're but, I mean, but they're not in fashion, but they still yeah. can give me some good advice. So I feel like definitely um, seek, you know, counsel from people that's like, that's really like, you know, you know, that have experience. Even sometimes with my mom. I mean, my mom was also an entrepreneur as well. So she's always with me when I do events. So she's always definitely coaching me and giving me advice and stuff like that as well. Um, also, I would say, like, starting off as an entrepreneur is definitely network. Like, as I was saying, like, like for me, I love art. But I don't necessarily always hang out with other artists. Even though I will hang out with other artists, I think the best form of networking is to connect with people in a whole other field as you. I mean, because that creates a very open op open market for you. I mean, just for example, even if let's say you hang with another artist, like for example, you, you have a blog, like you bring a whole other audience, a whole other mindset than somebody that's a designer or a jury designer. They're going to bring a whole other mindset, like, you know, Absolutely. style, this or that. Or somebody who may study film, they they're gonna be thinking about a whole nother mindset. Somebody that does photography, somebody that um that's a salesman, they have a whole nother mindset. And, and so sort of broadening like, your horizons, right? 
Yes. Broadening your horizon. Up. Have an open mind, too, if I feel like if you want to be an entrepreneur, like, you got to be open. Don't be closed off. Um, you know, don't, um, and, you know, sometimes it could be a little fearful, to, but, you know, keep the faith. Don't doubt yourself. Pray, you know. Um, and what was another question you asked? Um, I, I think that pretty much covers it all. What I will say is this. Um, I, have, I have a colleague who just joined uh, and is very much in the fashion industry. He um, attended FIT um, in okay. New York and also has a fashion line. And um, I'm wondering, like, just sort of my context on his work has, has spawned this question for me to you. Um, were, there, were there boundaries that you set for who you would network with when you were at the outset of your uh, line? What I mean by that specifically is, like, as you're still in the development process or trying to put together uh, maybe your first collection or what have you, do you hold on like reaching out to top level executives or like celebrities or what have you until you feel like you have a product that's solid or do you just go for the gusto from the game? Uh, bro, we kind of had a discussion about this um, the other day when we were talking about like some people say, um, I mean, I sometimes have been advised like don't do certain stuff if you prepare for it or whatever. Like you need to have that, um, you need because you, you don't want to talk yourself out of opportunity or you don't want to like make yourself look bad. I agree to that to a certain extent. However, I feel like take your chance because some opportunities just don't never come back. Like I look yeah. at things that happen to me in my life and if, I mean, a lot of things are the right place at the right time, but if I would have been a little fearful thinking like, I don't think I'm as, as prepared I don't think my stuff is top notch yet. Like I need to wait a little bit. I want to have accomplished as much stuff as I as I have. If I would be fearful, thinking like no, but I will say like, um, like people who I reach out to and who I want to do business with with my business, I'm I'm very open. I like I said, open mind. I'm very open. Like you never know who a person is, who they know. Um, you can't judge a book by their yeah, cover. Very so true. like I don't come off as being snobbish, like oh I'm too good to work with you, and I also don't want to come off as like I know it all, or I don't want to come off as um, I'm not prepared to work with you either. Uh, I just want to have an open mind, feel people out. Like I feel like a lot of things are it's, it's energy. Like you can feel like whenever you in a certain setting, like if you vibe with somebody or if it's going to work out with you or whatever. So I feel like definitely, um, I mean, I say the sky's the limit. Like for me, I know for me, I'll take some chances. Like even if I'm not prepared for stuff, I still go. <laughs> Bro, can you please, can you please tell the Wale story? Please tell the Wale story. You mean the Wale or the Young Thug story? Because I think the Young uh, Thug is whichever is one, a Whichever one required you to end up in a hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the young thug is more exciting. So like, yeah. So like, I basically I lived in New York where I was interning up there, and I, I, at the moment I didn't really like living in New York. So I had wrote down a list of people. I was like, I'm coming back home to Atlanta. I'm focusing on my clothing line, and I feel like there's some people I can get to that wear my pieces. I had Young Thug on my le on my list because at the time, you know, he was like the Calvin Klein sports model. Like every high end fashion magazine wanted him on the cover. Um, yeah. As he said, he was sacrificed. <laughs> and he was wearing dresses, he was wearing whatever, but fashion people loved him. And so I had him on my list. Like, I wouldn't get him, I wanted him to wear my pieces. And so, just so happened, I was in the Lineage Mall one day and he was there. He was in the mall. I was like, dude, I was like, this is a young thug. So I was like, man, I only let this opportunity pass by. And, um, <laughs> Not at the time I had I had the time I had a, at this particular moment I had another model with me. she was like I was preparing for a photo shoot and we were actually in, in um, Armani Exchange and then so one of his somebody his entourage was trying to talk to the model that I was with and I was like bro do you think that you can give him like one of my scars he was like yeah I'll do that so like weeks went by I didn't hear anything about it 
I told my mom this story. Mom always did like that. I said, you need to be giving these people your stuff. And blah, 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 blah. like, she don't know who your stuff is. She's like, you need to be giving these people your stuff. For free. Blah, blah, blah. They pay for it. I just felt bad about it. I felt very low. So I started working at Carter's. And Carter's headquarters is right across the street from Phillips Plaza and Lennox Mall. And I never yeah. went to Lennox Mall for my lunch breaks. But this particular day, I went there on my lunch break. I had my book bag full of merchandise. And as soon as I walk through Macy's into the mall area, I see Young Thug again. And I'm like, darn. I told my coworker, I was like, they go Young Thug again. Like, I ain't finna let him keep walking past me. And I ain't, I ain't gonna say nothing. Like, <laughs> now I'm going directly to him. I'm not going to nobody else in the entourage. And he was like, well, if you're gonna do it, you better hurry up because they walk fast. So I uh, start following behind them until they got to Neiman Marcus inside the mall. I had my box out with my merchandise and I was getting close to him and his security guard was like, no, 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 come back another time, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I'm Cedric, I'm an artist and fashion designer. Can I just um, give him one of my pieces? I do the artwork on the fabric. And the security guy, he must felt my energy. He was like, oh, these are nice. He's like, God must be with you today or something. Like, follow me. So he took me to where Young Thug was at because they kind of like, had made a secluded area. He was downstairs in the men's shoe department area. And so, like, I got to him. I shook his hand and stuff. I was being nervous. And then so everybody, so Young Thug was like, his, his sibling, whoever was with him was like, what you being nervous for? Why are you being nervous? And I was like, because I gave you one of my scars, like, weeks ago. And I didn't. <laughs> because he got 100 million and I don't yet. <laughs> That's why I'm nervous. <laughs> No, I, 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 for real though, I was like, I gave you one of my scars, and I was like, I don't know if you liked it. And he was like, um, no, he, he was like, nobody gave me no scar. And I was like, for real? He was like, how, how the dude look? Was like, was he fat? And I was like, I couldn't remember how the dude look. I was like, well, yeah, maybe he was or whatever. He like, he, he didn't give me no scar. So I was like, darn. So he was like, so I was telling him more about my friend, what I do. He was like, how much you charge? For this? And I was like, I was charged 90, but I've been doing sample sales. And he was like, I went about all of them. He put out a stack of money like that he had in his pocket and just gave it to me. And then like at the time, <laughs> I, I, mean, I was start like counting money and his entourage was looking at it like, yo, just take that money. <laughs> just looking back at it, but like. <laughs> like if you don't know someone, he that gave you the check, now get out. <laughs> yo, but I was still like, um, I was still talking to them. I was telling them about what I do. I was showing them my commercials and stuff. And then um, he told me, like, he liked the stuff and that he's uh, he going to be wearing it. And it took me a minute to actually see him actually wear my pieces. Like, yeah. um, I was, like, first stocking his IG pages. And one time I seen on his story um, that he had my um, pocket square in, in his back pocket, like, walking through Phil's Plaza a whole another day. And I was like, oh, he got my um, pocket square on. And then so then, like, that same day, it was the Beyonce concert. And he had, like, you know, like, when – Celebrities have concerts in Atlanta. They bring everybody out, so they brought Young Thug out. And mama come out. <laughs> yeah, so Young Thug came out and he had my scarf on at the concert. And I was like, so then, occasionally I would see him post. I he would make posts on his IG page. He would never tag, but he would probably like, he would probably try to show the name or something. Like he did pictures when he was coming off his airplane. He did stuff on his music videos, and like. So nobody can ever tell me nothing negative about Young Thug. I'm I'm a fan. Like he's a genuine person. 100%. Like uh, you know what I'm saying. Like he didn't have to do that. Most celebrities they always want you to give them something for free. They don't tag you. They don't. You know they like he was very like like he was a fan of me. Just like I was a fan of him almost. And like just see him wear my stuff or whatever. That that really meant a lot. Bro, that makes a world of difference, man. And, and I'll tell you this, like, being prepared, staying ready, that's, like, the major key to the game. Like, people people sleep on the fact that, like, pre when preparedness and opportunity meet, that's when, like, your magic will happen. Like, bro, the, the way I secured my first sponsorship, like, I just happened to be in a store that I shopped in very frequently. And the manager was in, and I was like, hey, y'all need to give me a discount. And he was like, <laughs> you're a joke <laughs> and I said no for real bro like I wear your clothes all the time and the reality is like people will probably come in here and purchase as a result of what they're seeing me do like give me just give me a conversation if you give me a conversation I'll make it work 
So he plugged me with the marketing director. The marketing director was like, yeah, so we're going to do a casual meet and greet with you and the president of the organization. And I was like, okay, cool. In my mind, casual conversation with the, the, the president of the organization is not casual. Like that's a serious, that's a serious ass conversation. <laughs> yeah. So I prepare like a whole presentation deck with all of my metrics and everything in it. I walk into the discussion. It's the marketing director, the president and CEO, the legal POC, and For real? Like, yeah, and one other person in the I was like, yo, <laughs> if I had walked in here thinking this was a casual conversation, I would have been screwed. But right. fortunately, <laughs> and I'm talking about like I put this deck together and sent it to like four or five people in my network, like, yo, can y'all take a look? Let me know if this makes sense. I got in, ran through my metrics, knew my value add. They were like, so we don't even really do social media. I said, that's okay. I can solve that for you. No problem. Here's what you're going to get. And they're like, okay, cool. Here's $10,000. Whoa. For real? Bro. Amazing. I'm telling you, there's like, from, from, from being prepared for, for your opportunity. I'm, I'm not joking, bro. $10,000 budget, straight up. Wow. That's man. So where did he, he forgot to tell us what company it was. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that deal has long since passed. <laughs> Somebody send me another company. <laughs> stat, stat, stat. <laughs> Help! Help me, I'm poor. <laughs> Hold on. So I want to also tell my audience, what a lot of people don't know is that Jonathan works for Facebook. And he's one of my only friends I know that really, like, works at the headquarters at Facebook. And you, the story that you told me about, like, taking the, the chance of getting that, you got to tell everybody about that, too, man. I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, there's like no secret recipe. It's a lot of grace and a lot of being blessed and being in the right place at the right time, man. Like I uh, I was working for a consulting firm for about four and a half years and uh, went to school to get my MBA at night. So I'm like closing out this MBA and trying to figure out how the hell I'm gonna pay this money back because Lord knows, <laughs> Emory was not cheap. And uh Facebook reached out to me on LinkedIn and um, oh. had a conversation with them. And to be perfectly honest with you, I, I thought that the LinkedIn message was a joke. So look, people reach out to you on LinkedIn and it's actually like, it's, it's, it's true. <laughs> so not everything is a scam. <laughs> Don't think it's a scam all the time, bro. I took the first call from Facebook while I was walking through an airport. Like I put the, I put the recruiter on hold for 10 minutes while I went through security. <laughs> <laughs> That is, that's not how you get a job, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> please, please don't take that as an example. <laughs> but um, went through the whole like pre-screen, had the conversation and she was like, you know, I think you're a really good fit. And true to form, I was like, look, you know, fantastic that we went through this interview, but I'm always one to like seek feedback because I need to know how I can improve. So I asked her like, look, you know, thank you for the opportunity. What can I do on my next interview to sort of knock it out of the park? Her response was, don't take your call in an airport. Have a great day. <laughs> I said, all right. <laughs> okay, cool. Good talk. Glad we had it. Glad we had it. Um, but yeah, from there, did a series of virtual interviews and then did an on-site out in Silicon Valley. And, you know, as, as fate will have it, the good Lord blessed me with a role. And I've been there for about 15 months at this point. And it's been nothing but a fantastic ride. Like, I think taking a step back and just trying to assess like the why. Um, yeah, it was a little bit more money on the table, but you got to think about the fact that cost of living in California is dumb high. So like pretty much balanced out. I think the real value add for this opportunity was like, I get an opportunity to see behind the curtain for how this social media stuff works. And I think yeah. a lot of people don't have that opportunity, nor do they have the insight of like how to best leverage the platform. And if I can like, build the knowledge, the wealth of knowledge to support that and like truly learn how to leverage this appropriately. I think it could render dividends in the long term. And for also, your blog. Yeah, for the blog, but also like, it's just a dope job. Like, I don't know nobody that provide breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> um, okay, so, so, so your slogan on your website is work nine to five and live five to nine. So you got to tell me, how do you do that with working at Facebook? Facebook must don't keep y'all past what? Like, y'all must don't work, like, the 6, 7 o'clock at night. Y'all 
Y'all y'all get off at five o'clock for real? I, I think I think it depends on the job. Let's just start there. <laughs> um as for me and my house. <laughs> Uh, no, in all seriousness, though, I, I work a, a, a pretty regular schedule. I mean, it's not quite banking hours. It's a little bit longer. But, um, I mean, I just got done, like, working for a major consulting firm, doing, like, 45 hours, 50 hours a week, and getting an MBA at the same time. So the amount of time that I have right now, I'm, I'm blown away with. Like, I feel like people don't understand, like, how much time you truly have on your hands until you get to, like, a space where you cut out one of the major things you were doing. And now you're like, holy cow, I got a lot more time back. Um, so to just give you a little bit of insight, me getting an MBA and working was somewhere between, like, 90 to 110 hours a week of me, like, working, studying, doing school. Got school out. And now I'm down to like a, a pretty regular work week, somewhere between like 40 to 45 hours a week. I have a whole nother 60 hours to like myself. I got yeah. bored at some point. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you're so used to working, you know, putting all those hours yeah. and stuff. In. And, you know, bro, like, so I went to SCAD and like the program was very rigorous. You know, like the, it was like ten weeks that you have in a in a class, and the projects was like very, very hard. So once I graduated, I feel the same way. Like I felt like, darn, like I have a little bit more time too. Like I feel like I I never worked. I mean, I still put in work, but at SCAD, I used to like sleep at the school and like sleep in my car and still have to be back up at like seven o'clock. Still, you know, put in work. And like when I graduated, I said I don't never want to work hard like that again. Like that Bruh. was like. <laughs> I like when I finished my degree, I told my classmates, yo, I'll cut off your piece because we got this together. <laughs> like I'm talking about I'm shutting down libraries with different people every night. Like school closed at eleven, okay, library open to one, we're gonna go there. Like, I hear you hundred percent. But you know, you do what it takes when it's something that you want, when it's something that you're passionate about, when you feel like it's a worthwhile experience, right? And so like that's kind of the mold I'm in right now. Like, yeah, I go to work. Bro, I take a <laughs> – so Silicon Valley is different, right? Like, they give you a bus. In mo most major organizations out here, give you a bus or a shuttle to get to work. So mm -hmm. I catch a bus, ride about an hour and a half to two hours to get to work, work for a whole day, then catch another hour and a half, two hours to get back to my car to drive home. From there, um, I'm, like, at home somewhere between 5.30 – and 7 p.m. just depending on how bad traffic is. And then I'm like on the computer trying to figure out how can I extend this brand in a way that makes sense. So who can I collaborate with? Who can I secure strategic partnerships with? Who can I secure sponsorship from? Is there an opportunity for me to do modeling? Like that sort of deal. And then on top of that, like trying to source additional people to do photo shoots with, to build content, to write a post, get it out in enough time so that the people who are editing are reviewing, like, it's it's a bunch of moving parts, much like what you were saying for your business. And so, like, we here, <laughs> we grind it, and we're living the millennial work nine to five, live five to nine. Like, and on in a normal situation where we not on house arrest from Corona, I'm turning up in between there. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I hear you. I also, I wanted to push back on like networking and like you said, you, sometimes you may feel like you're not prepared for opportunity. So, like, as you may know, I do pop-up shop, like, something everywhere. And, like, last year, at the beginning of 2019, I did a pop-up shop at the Heyman House. And they had some of, like, all kind of people were there, like, professional um, black people, a lot of artists. Pastor Troy was in there. Like, he walked past me. I didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, it was Pastor Troy. And then, like, yeah, it was a couple other people. But an, uh, it was an actor who was there. It was Lamar Rucker. He okay. was at... Lamar Rook is the guy he plays in um, on Greenleaf. He plays the role as Jacob. He also was yeah. in Why Did I Get He was um, Jill Scott's husband. So he in particular was at the show. And so as I told you with working with celebrities, like, you know, Young Thug was great. But I also had celebrities who were rude. Like, you know, like, like that, that wasn't cool. So I kind of somewhat got to the point where, like, oh, okay, if a person, I don't even know if I want to go out and reach, you know, reach out and talk mm -hmm. to them. But he was in my atmosphere for like a good 
five or ten minutes. I was like, okay, he in here. Let me just go ahead and reach out to him. So I was like, um, hey, how you doing? I like, this is what I do. This is my product. And I was like, could I give you something to wear? Could you post me? And he was like, um, hmm. He was like, so if a person's going to pimp me, you might as well be my own people. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so he just started. <laughs> oh, okay. Like, <laughs> yeah, so he started talking to me like almost as like a mentor would. Just telling me about working in the industry, being an actor, and he started talking about the show Greenleaf. And so he was like, you know, we um, he was telling me like how how they basically the costume designer buys product and like like he, they buy stuff particular on what room they're in and that everybody wear the same colors. And just just giving me a lot of background about the show. And so I was like, oh cool. I was because like I well like I was I had been watching Greenleaf probably like a year. Or so earlier, because I had found out that they take Greenleaf and Latonia. It's at this um, mansion where I took some business classes at. It was this Alley Entrepreneur Institute. And yeah. um, I was like told that they do, you know, the show there. And so I had been trying to reach the costume designer from way back then. And he was like, so, so he said, basically, I can give him something. And he was going to buy something. So I gave him a scarf and he bought some pocket squares and he told me that he was going to give it to the costume designer of the show. So I was like, wow, dope. And like, he talked to me for like a good minute at this pop-up shop, like, you know, like very supportive of everything. And I think he started following me back on social media too. So um, I found out who the costume designer was because I, I, I didn't hear anything. And I DM'd her and I was like, um, I was introduced to you through my Rucker and um, I make scars, ties and whatever. And I think my piece would be great for the show. I do the artwork on the fabric. And she was like, yeah, um, Lamar told me about you. So she followed me back. I didn't hear anything back. Uh, I want to say it took probably like a month or so. We will probably, we will be, we will talk. She was like, oh, we're going to do a meetup or so. So it probably took about two months. We finally did our first meetup and we met in by perimeter mall area. And um, I had showed them all my pieces and stuff. And they had just about bought all my pocket squares for the show. And they had bought a few of my pieces, kimonos, for the lead actress, Lynn Whitfield. But I will say all this. When I met them, they told me, Lamont Rucker, like, he is putting a good word for you. Like, that's my that's my little bro. Look out for him. Like, take mm -hmm. care of him. And I'm like, I had only met him once. So, like, that's right, you know, genuine relationship. And I'm like, man, I just want the way I can get to him to say thank you. But anyway. So I, I had, they had got product for me and they had told me like within a month later, can you make something else for us? We want something else for Lynn Whitfield for another scene. We wanted to be um, longer. And I was like, okay, that's cool. And um, so a month later they called me and they got the pieces. Within a few days later, they had told me Lynn Whitfield, you know, the lead actress on the show, they was like, she really loved your stuff. She wants your phone number. She wants you to make her something. I was like, are you serious? I was like, yeah, we're going to give her your number. And I was like, are you serious? And then so, like, Lynn Whitfield called me, like, five minutes later. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, and then she was like, you're a fan of me, but I'm a fan of you. Like, I really love your work. And I'm just telling her, like, I love you on the show. Like, you kind of remind me of the first lady at my church. Like, you like you be on it. You sharp. Like, everything, like, you know, you be doing that role and she was asking me like do, do I have a store and I was like no I don't have a store but I can go somewhere or whatever and so we met and then she was like call me Auntie Lynn and she got a couple more of my kimonos and she told me that she was going to Essence Festival and um, that she That's was so lit. yes and so like just so happened by coincidence I was actually at Essence Festival I had got a booth this particular year at Essence Festival. So it was just like, bro, amazing. there's nothing coincidental about any of this. That ain't never got. <laughs> I'm just putting that on the table, bro. Um, and when I got the photographs and I seen like behind the scenes of her, like wearing my product, like I was overwhelmed. I was in love. And yeah, yeah. that was one of the two that I kind of like, kind of like you write, you write things and you speak things into existence because. I had been watching Greenleaf like a year before I met Lamar. I just, because I found out that they taped it in Lithonia and I knew where they was taping it at. So I was like, you know, like, I was like, wow. I was like, I see they dress up in the show. You know, it's a church setting. They wear ties, wear pocket squares. Really anything that I watch nowadays, if I see people like dressed up, I'd be like, man, that's, that'd be a great place that I can network with. And just to yeah, see, you can I, plug in. 
provide the opportunity. Like, um, I, I'm still like that. Like everybody, even Lynn Whitfield told me she was like, you know, Lamont, he's he was putting a good word for you. He was like, that's my brother. Like, look out for him. Like, she told me that the costume designer told me that, and that was like pure love. Like, and he that's only meant. So the thing is, going back to that preparedness, Lynn Whitfield, on the last day of the set of them taping, she invited me on set, and she introduced me to everybody. She treated me like I was her family. And because she had, had me create a painting for her, and she gave it out as cards to everybody on the staff. And so, like, I walked around, I met everybody, and I finally got to meet Lamar Rucker again. And I, you know, I gave him some stuff, and I was just going to say thank you so much. Everybody told me that you were putting in a good word for me and you had only met me once. And he was like, you know, I meet people all the time and that, you know, that I'll be wanting to help, but they're not always prepared. And I'm happy that that you were prepared and you didn't make me look bad. And I'm just like, that was, that was God, thank God. And also like the relationships and stuff too. A hundred percent. I think just as we close, like a running theme for this conversation has been like, be flexible, be prepared, but also be patient. Because like, you, you're you rushing into God only knows what, like when it's right, it'll come to you. And it's not like, it might be difficult for you to traverse an issue or what have you, but like big picture, in the grand scheme of things, it's going to make sense. And it's not going to be like, I'm not going to say it's not going to be hard because I think hard is the wrong term in this instance. But like the the difficulty that you would face trying to go it alone versus taking your time, trying to build the network, having the right conversations, just being in position and being poised for the opportunity that comes your way will make your life so much simpler. So much simpler, yep. though. And also being in God's will too. That's I mean, it's basically about what you're saying. Like, you you can sometimes make things rough for you not being in God's will. And not saying that you always know what it is, but sometimes you just kind of like feel in your spirit, like you be led in certain places and certain situations where it it just happens. That you know. Absolutely, and I mean, like, this isn't at all to demean the conversation in any way, because I 100 percent am like full-fledged Christian, but for those of you who are spiritual, like, just getting in tune with what the universe has in store for you and, like, silencing your mind and, and, like, not trying to press the issue yourself, but really just allowing things to come your way will oftentimes get you where you want to be as well, you know, trying to trying to be non-denominational in this discussion, if you will. <laughs> okay, yeah. Hey, but um, Jonathan, I have a few questions that I, I don't think I answered. I know somebody had they had reached out to me on DM. Oh, really? Okay, cool. I think one of them was what keeps me inspired. I don't think I answered that. Um, sure, go right ahead. I don't say um, what keeps me inspired is basically like, of course, I have mentors, so I enjoy the calling them, speaking to them, going to lunch to them, being around them automatically inspires me. But also, I like listening to inspirational videos. I like watching artists. Not as it can be like a painting artist, it can be like a performer or a singer. I like looking at old interviews and watching people like when they were in their prime. Like I can look at their interviews, I can watch their performances, and like they're them being in their prime, you can feel like their energy, but like they're hungry for things. They're like they they own it, and like looking at stuff like that, I can look at that at any time of the day. It inspires me like. Wow, I want to get that energy. I want to be, um, I want to be just as great as that. So, if it's a time when I'm down or something, I'm definitely going to turn in an inspirational video, and I'm probably going to write or reach out to my mentor or talk to people that are in my inner circle, just to you know to keep me, keep me inspired. You be watching Bob yeah. Ross. <laughs> Bob Ross. Who is Bob Ross? No, Bob, Bob Ross. <laughs> you talking about the painter with the afro? <laughs> you know, I actually, as a kid, I grew up watching him, though, like... Bro, boy, you ain't have a cable, boy. You